Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As usual, I want to remind everybody, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. So some episodes back, I had talked about the fact that I think that there's something going on with feminism slash like gender relations that at the time I was having a hard time kind of putting my finger on the words that I wanted to kind of verbalize how I was feeling and what I was thinking. And it's something I've been thinking about on and off ever since then. And then a couple of days ago, I found on my Twitter timeline a piece by Kathy Young. She wrote this for the LA Times, but she does also write for Reason and other publications. She's a great, great writer. And ironically enough, this is a piece about feminist reaction to Jordan Peterson. But there's a couple of quotes in here that I want to start with because some of this really kind of like it helped crystallize what it was that I was trying to say and it kind of helped me find the words that I was looking for. So let's go ahead and get into that and then we'll discuss everything a little bit further. The title of the piece is, Hate on Jordan Peterson all you want, but he's tapping into frustrations that feminists shouldn't ignore. And I want to go ahead and kind of start skipping past some of this into the parts that I think are really relevant to what I want to talk about today. First up, For all of his flaws, Peterson is tapping into a very real frustration. More than half a century after the modern feminist revolution began in the 1960s, we have yet to figure out new rules for partnership between men and women. Although Peterson can sound like a chauvinistic crank when he seems to suggest that women incite sexual harassment by wearing makeup to the office, his larger points, that evolving norms are generating confusion and mixed signals, and that women play a role in sexualizing work environments, are far from absurd. Now, this part for me was kind of the light bulb moment, pointing out that we removed the old gender norms, which, by the way, I totally agree with. They needed to go in order for us to get to where we want to be as a more equal society for everybody. But then pointing out that we started integrating genders and never really created any kind of new gender norms for people to know how to interact with each other. That was kind of like the the aha moment, like, that's it. That's what it is, is we've gone all this time without ever redefining gender roles. And I think that that's what's really going on right now. I mean, somewhat with the Me Too movement, but also with these kind of ideas of trying to make it to where men can do this and not do that, but do it in this place and not that place, is this idea of trying to redefine gender roles for a gender integrated society going forward in the piece and also kind of solidifying the point. Consider, we have rejected traditional sexist proprieties that forbade coarse language in front of the ladies, yet a man can now be fired for telling a crude joke that offends a female co-worker. Calling women the weaker sex would have been considered shockingly retrograde, yet ambivalent sexual encounters are easily recast as violations of women, with men presumed entirely responsible for ensuring consent. Workplace romances abound, yet flirting can be one step away from someone's idea of sexual harassment. This leads into a point that I want to discuss a little further on in this episode, but I feel like, and it seems to me, and this paragraph kind of also reinforces the point that there are people who either overtly or covertly are trying to take gender roles and regress them instead of progress them. It seems like there's kind of like a rolling back of trying to go back to the old way of doing things versus pushing forward and finding a new way of doing things. Going back to the piece. Despite occasional lip service to the idea that feminism can liberate men too from the patriarchal confines, most feminist discourse spends far more time bashing men for trivial transgressions. The fact that the word masculinity so often appears next to the word toxic says a lot about this cultural moment. So does the proliferation of neologisms for bad behavior with man as a prefix, mansplaining, mansplitting, etc. Meanwhile, male troubles are met with the what about the men's mockery. Just look at the debate about Peterson. British journalist Helen Lewis has jeered that he is viewed as a serious intellectual because he's writing for sad young white men, and their problems are, you know, real problems. Now, to state the obvious, you cannot be advocating for gender equality while denigrating one gender. It wasn't funny and cute when men did it back in the day by calling us dumb or frivolous or hysterical or simple-minded or anything like that. And it's not cute when women 
try to turn men into this bad thing and try to turn the term man into an insult. It's That's not how you're going to get to equality. You can't put down men and say that you want to be viewed as equal to them. Because then if that's how you view men and you want to be seen as equal to them, like how does how does that even jive? Like that makes no sense to me. And also mocking anybody's problems because you think that they're insignificant is a pretty shitty thing to do. I mean, you shouldn't make fun of anybody. I mean, we all have our shit that we're going through. Everybody's everybody's going through something. Nobody's life is perfect. I mean, even look at poor Kate Spade, who just committed suicide by hanging herself, for Christ's sake. I mean, literally the last person on earth that you would think would ever have a problem. But it does go to prove that everybody has something that they're going through. And just because that person may happen to be a cis white male doesn't make their struggles any less more important or difficult than anyone else's. Basically, what I was trying to say with that whole rant is just don't dismiss people's problems out of hand just because you think that they have a better life than you. Nobody knows what's going on in anybody's life. So to look at somebody's exterior and think, oh, your problems must just be so much lighter and easier than my problems because I have this genitalia and you have that genitalia or you live this kind of life and I live that kind of life. Like somehow this is some kind of like Olympic sport where we get to compare issues is really just, it's it's a shitty thing to do. And I really wish everybody would stop doing it across the board. Anyway, back to the piece and to kind of wrap that up. For all its successes, contemporary feminism's main message to men is not one of equal partnership. Rather, it's repent, abase yourself, and be an obedient feminist ally, and we still won't trust you. It's no wonder why Peterson has found an eager audience in this climate. If feminists don't like his message, they should offer a better one. Yes, this, this right here. Can I get it embroidered on a pillow that I can sell to people or give away to people so that they can figure out where exactly this has all gone wrong? You can't ask men to basically repent for being who they are and then At the same time, even if they do that, even if they go through all the performative acts, even if you you bash men, you bash yourself, you come out as a quote unquote ally, which that's a whole nother ball of wax. And then you, you you still don't want to trust them. Like what the fuck more do you want them to do? It kind of gives you the idea that hint, hint, maybe current feminists don't actually want gender equality. And that seems a good a segue as any for me to discuss my thoughts on feminism in general and also the current state of the feminist movement. Now, I will be the first to say the first and second wave did work. Like, I go back all the way, I take first wave, go all the way back to the suffragette movement and even before that. I mean, these are women who fought for the right for us to vote, the right for us to go be educated, to go enter the workplace to try to agitate for us to actually be able to do something in the workplace more than just being like a stenographer or a secretary. There was a lot of work that those women did. And while I don't necessarily agree with all of it, I mean, I will say that those two waves were incredibly, incredibly beneficial to women and to society in general in getting us to where we are today with having something of an integrated society with genders. This current embodiment, this third wave, fourth wave, I don't even know what wave we're on now. I don't really know what it is they're wanting to do. I don't really get them. And I have this kind of working theory about millennials and Gen Z that kind of goes beyond this, but I think the reason a lot of this is happening, kind of this SJW thing, and stuff like that is every generation wants to have that great thing that they fight for, whether it be an actual like physical war, like you go off to war, or even if you're here and you're fighting like a cultural war, you're really like trying to move society forward. And as I see it, pretty much all of the big wars have already been fought and won. So now you're just kind of left with a group of people that, like most young people, you want to be part of something. You want to say that you did something. 
but all the things by and large have already been done. So there's really nothing left for you to do. So now you latch on to gender pronouns and hate speech and stuff like that because there's there's nothing left for them. Like the boomers and Gen X pretty much finished off everything. Like we we put in the work, we got most of the important stuff done, and now really all that's left is scraps. Now my thoughts on why we never reset up new gender roles is also kind of rolling back, going back to the baby boomers, they were still in the fight to get rid of the old gender wars. Like that was their focus. So they weren't so much concerned about what would happen afterwards because they were still, they were still fighting the fight. They were still fighting the fight to get rid of the old ones. So obviously they weren't particularly focused on making new gender roles or kind of ensuring other ways of gender equality. Moving on to Gen X, now, I, like I said, I'm a late Gen X or early millennial. I definitely identify more with Gen X than I do as a millennial. And my thoughts on this is it was very much a different time then. Like, I'm, I'm trying to find the best way to explain it to people who weren't there, but the idea of having any kind of defined anything was so absurd because everything was changing so fast that the idea of trying to enforce a norm on anything was like, why bother? It's going to be obsolete in two years. Like, I can't begin to explain to people that weren't there. It's literally everything in the world was changing at a rapid pace. Like you, the Soviet Union fell, the internet, genders becoming actually more equal things like that. Like it was just everything that could possibly be in constant flux was in constant flux. So of course we weren't interested in redefining gender roles either, because like I said, it would have seemed absurd to us. It, it would have seemed absurd to make any rules about anything. And that I think is one of the great things about Generation X, because the world and society was so kind of just nebulous and freeform. It really gave a lot of space for gay people, trans people, people of color, women to kind of come to the forth. And because it was very much an anything goes kind of attitude, it was kind of viewed as, well, okay, of course, we're going to view these people as rightful individuals, as equals. And that really, I think, paved a lot of the way for a lot of even what's still happening today. So hooray for us. But like I said, in that environment, it would have seemed very, very odd to us to try to enforce any kind of gender norms or to try to say how sexes should interact with each other. We would have looked at you like, what's wrong with you? Why are you trying to regress? Why are you trying to go back to the old way? We're trying to figure out a new way forward. And I think that's part of why I really don't get this current environment, because that's the environment I was raised in, in that kind of environment where really anything goes. And of course, men and women can talk to each other and converse and have relationships. And it's not some kind of weird thing where you need rules and rituals and everything, because we came from the generation that had just fought the war to get rid of all of that. So of course, we were not interested in trying to set up anything. But obviously, this generation very much is interested in setting up rules and rituals in while I was kind of thinking through my thoughts on this and kind of thinking through my thoughts on this episode, I was reminded of something that Camille Paglia said, and ironically, I think she actually said it during her discussion with Jordan Peterson, about how before we kind of had this feminist movement, and obviously going all the way back to hunter-gatherer society, all the way up to where we started gender integration, by and large, everybody spent the day with their own genders, like Men spent the majority of their days with men and women spent the majority of their days with women. And just on a practical level, like the amount of time, like in a 24 hour day that men and women would actually associate with each other versus associating with their own gender was incredibly small. And I started thinking about that because it really feels to me like that's where feminism is trying to take gender relations right now is to try to separate it back out into those different spheres where women kind of associate with other women and men just associate with other men. But the problem is they seem to want to take 
95% of the sphere for women and then just leave like 5% for the men, which that's not gender equality. I mean, first of all, gender segregation is not gender equality. We all agreed that separate but equal is not equality. The Supreme Court decided that. But trying to minimize men and to try to shove them out of society is not the way forward to gender equality or to a gender inclusive society. And to tie it back to the point that I was making earlier, going in that direction direction is obviously regressive instead of progressive. And I find it very interesting that different groups of people that would not typically agree with each other at all, like I'll, I'll take the two, the, the two, the horseshoe theory, I'll take the two extreme ends. I'll take the trad girls and the rad femmes who would not agree with each other on much of anything you would think. But I think both sets of people would agree that men should have their world and women should have their world and you don't really have a lot of commingling, which I don't agree with, obviously. I want our society to be gender inclusive. I don't want gender segregation. I want gender integration because I like you guys. And when I say guys, I mean those of you who have penises. I like you guys. You're fun. I like hanging around with you. I don't want to be in this world where you're like, shunted off in this little corner and like you can't talk to me and I can't talk to you like that sounds horrifying like like I said we we fought a whole culture war to get rid of that I don't understand people wanting to go back to it but it does seem like that is where a lot of feminists are running to like with open arms like they're running away from everything that the boomers and gen x did as far as getting gender inclusion and they're like running away from it screaming and I don't understand why? Like, what? what's wrong with you? Like, why are you doing this? Like, we put in so much work for you guys and you guys are just like throwing it into the trash can. Like, I don't, I don't get you. Anyway, I have thoughts about how I would like to see gender relations go forward. And first of all, my obvious utopian ideal is, can we please be a post-gender society? Because I fucking hate identity politics and that's all this is, and I'm tired of it. I hate it. Can't we all just be individuals, regardless of whatever genitalia we do or do not have, and just be viewed as people? That's my ideal. But until we can possibly get to my post-gender utopia, what needs to happen is not this regressive environment where we go back to segregating the sexes. We need to start putting in the hard work of figuring out how men and women can get along together in the workplace, in college campuses, in society, without this constantly being like some massive weird struggle that, like I said, I still don't understand. But apparently some people want there to be rules and rituals to this. So let's sit down and start thinking about the fact that If that's what you want, then it needs to be equal for both sexes. And there's going to need to be a lot of discussion and a lot of sitting back and listening to the other gender and trying to find a middle ground. Because it seems to me right now that feminists seem to want men to completely relate to them on just their level and not give men the respect of trying to listen to things from their side. Which, like I said, that's not equality. That's just you trying to impose your will upon somebody else. Which, obviously, for many reasons, I don't agree with imposing your will on other people. But, like I said, there just needs to be more of a dialogue. And people need to be more open to having the dialogue. And not just immediately, like, shut it down because, oh my god, you're a cis white male. And your opinions don't matter because of that. Like, don't... Stop it. Stop it. Stop shutting people down based off of stupid, petty bullshit like their genitalia or their sexual orientation or their melanin. Like, it's not, it's not conducive to anything. It's not going to get us anywhere. It's not going to make any kind of progress for us to go forward as a gender-integrated society. And one last point I want to make before I wrap this up. And I know y'all are probably tired of shit of hearing me talk about this because I've already done a whole episode on it. 
I keep talking about it, but I do feel like this is incredibly important. Ladies, in order for us to get to my gender equality utopia, you're going to have to start taking self-ownership. You're going to have to start taking responsibility for yourself and your decisions. Stop blaming everything on men. Stop, please, please, if I could ask anything, please stop placing your sexual agency in the hands of men and basically trying to be hands off. Stop being a victim. In order for gender equality to happen, everybody is going to have to stand on their own two feet. No more blaming one gender for your problems because honestly, your problems stem from yourself. Blaming them on somebody else is a cop out. Stop doing it. Stand up, own your decisions, and then we can start going forward. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. I know this is going to be a little shorter episode than I've done over the past probably month or so, but I feel like I said everything I wanted to say. So why keep going? I've made my points. And so I'll go ahead and wrap this up. As usual, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Take care and until next time.